Good afternoon, Professor Pretorius. It's a pleasure to have you on our expert interview of the Long COVID Affairs community. Thank you very much for the kind invitation. Professor Pretorius, you have been researching fiber aggregates, also called microplots, for a long time. Would you be so kind as to share your latest findings with us? Thank you, I will do so. Uh, can you see my screen? So I think the screen is yours. Hello everyone, thank you for this kind opportunity for me to share some of our insights on microplot and platelet hyperactivation as key pathologies in long COVID. The focus of this talk, because I know it's, it's short and you need to, um, to have a specific time for it, I will try to focus the, the, the talk uh, briefly, but I will talk about the relevance of receptor inflammatory marker interactions in driving the disease pathology, as well as the relevance of direct protein-protein interactions in clotting pathologies. And here I'll specifically focus on the um, formation of microclots in the presence of spike protein and other circulating inflammatory molecules in long COVID. And then I will also briefly touch upon novel methods in diagnosing well-known as well as new diseases such as long COVID. In our research, and what we have been finding is that long COVID is a thrombotic endothelitis. And therefore our research focus over the years doing work on long COVID as well as, as acute COVID is on how inflammatory molecules might cause clotting pathology in the presence of both viral as well as bacterial inflammagens, and then also how these inflammatory molecules, like the spike protein, also interact with platelets at red blood cells and fibrinogen, which, as I already mentioned, is the main clotting protein. So just a bit of a background, I'm not going to spend too much on this. I just want to show you this figure to, to basically try to let you consider the fact that platelets have numerous possible places on their membranes in the form of receptors that can, can have interactions with circulating inflammatory molecules. Platelets don't only have all of these inflammatory molecule receptors they, where they can activate from, they can also interact with and form um, these complexes, immune signaling complexes, where the platelets can interact with immune cells. And these complexes may also further drive the disease pathology. So therefore, we're very interested in platelets and how they interact in the presence of inflammatory molecules, including spike protein. If we turn our attention to the clotting protein fibrinogen, the healthy fibrinogen molecule typically has got lots of small little alpha coils and little beta sheets. However, if there are inflammatory molecules in circulation, this structure might change where this soluble um, clotting protein might interact with inflammatory molecules directly causing clotting pathology. And the main reaction then in our hands is, and in our understanding is that the fibrinogen will change into an insoluble little microclot that as it moves along in circulation, it just gathers all molecules on its way and uh, which these molecules might have been shed by the cells, the endothelial cells, platelets, and also spike protein in the presence of spike protein, and it will change the structure of the, the soluble fibrinogen as it's supposed to be when it's in a healthy individual to a more insoluble little structure. So if you just look at this diagram, it just shows the numerous places where platelets, endothelial cells, and fibrinogen might have interactions with each other. And all of these interactions might drive a pathological endothelial vascular system. And therefore we say that in long COVID, our endothelial layers are so damaged that it results in a thrombotic endothelitis that is widespread and affects all possible vasculatures of the body. Now, if I just go back to acute COVID, this is just what we found right in the beginning of the pandemic. And if you look at these micrographs, you can see that the, the um, if you look at the, the platelets and the red blood cells and the clotting pathology in, in these 
acute COVID-19 patients, we could see, we saw severe platelet hyperactivation where the platelets really um, didn't have a, a structure as we would find in a healthy individual, where they also had significant interactions with red blood cells, if you look at the middle micrographs, where they interact with the red blood cells and attach to the red blood cells and also form, form little complexes. And then we also found these significant clotting uh, pathologies that we later to microclots that actually also glue together the red blood cells. If you look at the, the, the little arrows in the um, diagram, the blue arrows specifically. Now, if we, we looked at these clotting pathologies in scanning electron microscopy, but then early on, we also looked at acute COVID samples versus controls using our fluorescent markers for platelet hyperactivation. And here we, we saw the same, the same scenario. We saw that we have got numerous platelets that are hyperactivated. We see that they've got P-selectin, which is a very interesting molecule that can either be inside the platelets in a healthy individual, or it can be on the membranes where they form adhesion receptors, or it can be shed. Uh, and, and we found all of these platelet hyperactivations as well in our acute uh, samples. Then to our surprise, we also found when we look at the platelet poor plasma without addition of thrombin, so not activating the clotting pathology or clotting uh, pathway in the acute COVID-19 plasma, we could actually find misfolded protein and we measured it by using theoflavin T. Now theoflavin T is a, is a, a marker that fluoresces green when it is bound to open hydrophobic areas on damaged protein. Now, if you just recall, just recently I mentioned that in a healthy individual, the protein structure has got little alpha coils and few beta sheets. But if there are interactions with the clotting protein, fibrinogen, between the fibrinogen and inflammatory molecules like spike protein, the structure can change and it changes to little insoluble uh, clotting um, or microclot that, that we can mark with the flavin T. So as you note, in healthy individuals, you will find a little um, microclot formation, not, not very much at all. Obviously, it will not ever be zero because all of us have got some misfolded folding of protein here and there. So it's not, we cannot expect to have zero microclots in a healthy individual versus someone with acute or long COVID. The same with type 2 diabetes. We do find clotting misfolding of, of clotting protein in type 2 diabetes plasma as well, as we would find in rheumatoid arthritis or any other cardiovascular disease. So we do accept that there are microclots formation in other diseases as well, and that's very important for us because many of these diseases also have underlying clotting pathology. Now, just to show you what, what, we, what we mean when I say that there are also clotting pathology in other diseases. If you look at this micrograph, in A, you can see a healthy individual. You will see here and there a few little dots of microclot formation. Uh, of This is a smear of a whole blood smear that we looked under the scanning electron microscope. I revisited my samples from many years ago, long before acute COVID, to see what have we, what is in our raw data that, that we perhaps didn't uh, report on in our publications at the time. And here you could see example of, of lupus. We, we also found clotting. Lupus is also well known to be a condition where you have got clotting pathology. Then obviously C and D, I just show again how microclot formation looks like in acute COVID. And if you turn your attention to E and F, you can also see microclots that are formed in rheumatoid arthritis and also even present in conditions like Alzheimer's type diseases. So it's not a new concept. It's We just had a new term for it. And at the time when we did the analysis, we did not necessarily think much of what we have been seeing. So it's always good to, to revisit your, your previously published raw data of publications. Now that said, in 2021, when we first were looking, and in 2020, when we first looked at acute COVID, we also thought to, to add spike protein, and specifically the S part of the spike protein, to healthy 
uh, plasma and, and whole blood. And we could indeed, and we also published on that trigger, microclot formation as well as platelet hyperactivation, adding spike protein to a healthy blood sample. And here you could see what we found. We then also did scanning electron microscopy again, and here again we saw with the spike protein, we could induce these microclots that, that formed spontaneously in the presence of spike protein S1. We also used microfluidic systems where we studied uh, these microclot formation. You can see there um, in the in, in the, the micrograph on the on the right, you could see a healthy plasma. There is little microclot formation in, in our microfluidic system in COVID-19, lots of microclots that you would expect. And then in a healthy individual where we added spike protein, we could in fact induce in the microfluidic system as well, numerous um, microclots that, that travel through the fluidic system. Just interestingly, Dr. Martin Crater from the Max Planck Institute have also developed a system where he looks at red blood cells deformability and also white blood cell deformability. And they have also found spike protein interactions and they also have found microclots using their system. Uh, we also have such a system that he kindly donated, uh, the Max Planck Institute kindly donated to us in Stellenbosch, and we are working together with them to also use their microfluidic system to look at microclot formation, as well as red blood cell and, and uh, platelet deformability in his system. Now, we also looked at older beta and delta versus Omicron variants. And interestingly, we do know that people that develop acute COVID from Omicron are less ill than the older, more virulent beta and alpha variants. And that, that we also saw where in Omicron, in the acute phase, the microclots are not as prominent as we found from the earlier variants. Platelets were something we saw we could not really see a difference between Omicron platelets um, and beta and alpha. They, they were similarly activated. That said, it's not necessarily a fact that now if you develop Omicron, uh, long COVID from Omicron, that you will be less severely ill with long COVID, beta and the, and the delta variants. In fact, we have found that uh, individuals who developed long COVID after Omicron were just as ill and just as many microclots in the long COVID phase than, than from the other um, earlier variants. Now, just to turn our attention to long COVID, here you can see how a typical platelet looks like a healthy platelet in the, in the diagram on the left. Here on the right, you could see how platelets are activated in long COVID patients. Platelets are significantly activated, broken up, shedding all of their uh, various contents. And they also form these complexes that we would say uh, is would be a, a platelet immune complex. Uh, and these, the size of these platelets are also significantly increased. And here's also just from our um, other type of analysis, our fluorescent microscopy, we see platelets on the left. You can see how a typical platelet would look like in a healthy individual, small little round balls, but significantly hyperactivated and attached to each other, forming huge immune complexes with each other in individuals with long COVID. And then once again, our scanning electron microscopy, here you could see a red blood cell typically found in healthy individuals without anything on it, on its membrane. And in long COVID, significant microclot formation, uh, once again, also attaching the red blood cells to each other, forming these sticky deposits in our circulating blood of our long COVID patients. And this is just a high magnification of a red blood cell with these microclots on the membrane, suggesting that it really has a significant impact on red blood cell functioning as well. Because if you remind yourself again, a red blood cell needs to transport oxygen and get oxygen to the necessary areas where it would need oxygen in the various organ systems. So if the red blood cells are severely compromised by their attachment to these microclots, and also the fact that the endothelial layers are damaged and pathological, where they cannot sufficiently access the oxygen transported by the red blood cells, not only that, 
If one also thinks the function of the red blood cell is to remove CO2 and all sorts of um, molecules that have been used by our cells back to the red blood cells, to the lungs, to be uh, getting rid of by breathing it out, then obviously we can see that there is a significant possible pathology between the endothelial layers as well as the red blood cells functioning properly. And here again is just the example of microclots in whole blood uh, of, of long COVID patients. So this is just a supposed to be a, sol a, in, uh, a, a soluble uh, molecule, fibrinogen molecules, but in long COVID, we see these microclot deposits, which significantly uh, impairs uh, the endothelial function uh, as, as we understand it. So previously, before we, we had uh, any possible way to look at uh, quantifying microscopy, we uh, and and also we, we tried to see how we could do quantification of microscopy so that a clinician or our clinical collaborators or anyone reading our papers might understand how we see platelets and uh, microclot formation. We developed a quantification way, a grading system, and. Obviously, then and now, we realize that it is a difficult method to try to quantify microscopy. Microscopy is supposed to visualize changes of pathology. It's not the best method for quantification, although with this grading system, we try to quantify it. And thank goodness we've moved on from, from just a grading system to a flow cytometry method, which I will get into a little bit later. So here you can see how we we try to quantify our platelets by our platelet grading system. The spreading micrographs look at the top is probably we you find in a healthy individual, probably the second row as well. And uh, sometimes in a healthy individual, the third row as well, but it's more in these from three and four is probably spreading that you would typically find in a long COVID patient. And then clumping in a healthy individual, you would not necessarily find any clumping or immune complexes, as I showed in with the scanning electron microscopy. But in long COVID patients, we do see significant clumping and complexing of platelets with themselves. And this is how just we how we portray, portray it. And then Obviously, also the microclot grading system. Um, you can see how as we, how we show it. The the first, the top two rows um, shown here, is just simply how we would typically find microclots in a healthy individual. And then we, as we progress down, you could find how microclots would look like in an individual with uh, with long COVID. Now, I just again put the picture here that I already showed. So this is a scanning electron microscopy method of how a clot would look like um, from a healthy individual's blood sample. No preparation except for just a drop of blood onto a, a, um, a slide and prepared for scanning electron microscopy. Here we could also see microclots in a, in a whole blood sample where the microclots are entrapped in between red blood cells. So one of the questions that we, we have we've received recently is how sure are we that these microclots are actually true clots? And the typical definition of a true clot, the older definition before we came up with the term microclot is that it contains fibrinogen, but it also might contain red blood cells, platelets, and white blood cells. So one of the, the questions is so so is 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 there still a clot if it if it's a microclot? And our understanding is yes, it indeed is, because depending on how you look at your red blood cells and your platelets and where you look, we do find a true definition of a clot where these clots are entangled with white blood cells, red blood cells, and platelets. Uh, so the, the term microclots, we do not really see why it should be a controversial term. And as we looked at microclots on platelets and the interactions with red blood cells and with platelets, we do think that the term microclot is indeed a good definition for the clotting pathology and the misfolding of the fibrinogen molecules that we have seen.
Now, we also turned our attention to proteomics, where we wanted to determine what is inside the plasma. And I think uh, all, of, all of you might have seen our papers where we, we in fact, could initially not digest the, the, the plasma from the acute COVID or long COVID samples that we had. And we, with the first trips and digestion step, we, if you look at this slide, we looked at the plasma from our controls and our diabetes sample, and, and the first trips and digestion step indeed digested all the, the content of the plasma, but in both acute COVID and the long COVID sample, the first trips and digestion step, step could not digest the, the microclots. We developed a second digestion step, and then we, in 2021, published a proteomics analysis to where we showed what is trapped inside the clots when we could digest it. And you would expect that we would find fibrinogen chains because we say it's a microclot and the origin is from fibrinogen. And we indeed found fibrinogen chains inside the clot. That's what we would have expected to find, I think. We also found the Willebrand factor, which is a very important marker for, for endothelial damage, and it also activates platelets. But we also found the regular things that we would, would have expected, the C-reactive protein. We found uh, various complement factors that might be involved in immune activation. But then we found a molecule that is called alpha-2 antiplasmin. And if you look at this molecule, alpha-2 antiplasmin, and if you look at this clotting uh, diagram that we all know of, of clotting, how it, it's got the, the, the various common pathways, the clotting pathways, we see that alpha-2 antiplasmin reacts on the pathway where the clot after it's formed should be able to digest by a process called fibrinolysis. Now, alpha-2 antiplasmin works on the plasmin pathway to prevent the clot from breaking down. So one of the questions that we also have is, so why, why don't you measure D-dimer? If there are clots in circulation, microclots or whatever clots in circulation, then you would expect D-dimer to be present as well. Now, the reason D-dimer is not a good marker in long COVID, and we and others have looked at it before, and it's not a good marker, is because D-dimer is a marker of clot breakdown. If the clots aren't breaking down and stay in circulation for a long time, the dimer will not be raised. What we have noted, and some people have noted it, if they then um, they, they treat the uh, clotting pathology, whether by anticoagulation or by molecules like natokinase and seropeptase, which are enzymes that break down clots, suddenly the D dimer levels might rise. And that we have found. And that is what we would expect as well. Uh, however, if we look at the, the situation when clots are not broken down, patients are not on any treatment, D dimer is not a good marker for long COVID. Now the question arises, as I mentioned previously, where can we look at our, a method? Is there a methodology where we could look for microclot presence, but not necessarily using microscopy, which is difficult for quantification? And thank goodness, and with the help of many of the long COVID patients and with Kernels and Polybio Research Foundation and Bulvi Research Foundation, we were able to acquire a imaging flow cytometer in our laboratory. Now, an imaging flow cytometer is a little bit different than a usual flow cytometer because you can also actually track and visually see what you are imaging or what the flow cytometer is seeing. So we developed a method whereby we took our platelet-poor plasma, so cell-free plasma, and we put it through our imaging flow cytometer and we could measure the microclots in a healthy individual and a long COVID individuals. So, so, so we could indeed adapt a typical imaging flow cytometry method that is usually used to look at cells for a cell-free method. And that was recently published in Helion in one of the cell journals. And here you could see the differences that we found. This is just an example. If you look at the microplots that we did see, this example here shows you what you can visualize with the imaging flow cytometer. And what is also interesting is one could then determine the microclots area ranges. 
for the between the long COVID and the, the the healthy controls. Now the question is, is this simply a bimodal effect? So what do I mean with that? Is it simply that controls are in the one area and long COVIDs are in the second area? If we look at rheumatoid arthritis, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, any other of these conditions, would they just simply fall within the second area that will, meaning where the long, where we have found the, the size ranges and the area ranges and the numbers of microplots for long COVID? Or is it a multimodal type of uh, analysis that you can do with um, this? Stuff of of methodology, and the question is simply: Don't know the process of developing such a such a, a method. We will report back when we when we do have analysis of different um, inflammatory conditions, comparing it to long COVID as well as um, as actual. So at this stage, we do only have data for the for long COVID and controls on our imaging flow cytometer. And this first method was basically to set a method for the um, for, for the use of imaging flow cytometry. I also briefly want to touch upon treating of microclots and platelet hyperactivation. That said, I'm not a clinician, so I can't really answer detailed questions about treatment responses and treatment regimes. We only have received data from uh, our clinical collaborators where we tracked patients um, with, with long COVID before and after treatment. And here's just some, some of the results where we showed that there was a significant improvement of our patients. And if you look at this uh, diagram here, we can see that 80% of the patients showed a uh, showed by filling in the, the, the different scores the, the PGIC scores where the patients say whether they are better themselves or not, 80% of the patients actually felt better after the treatment. We also looked at, and if you look at the micrograph presented here, if the patient said they felt better, the microclot load also uh, reduced. So that was quite interesting for us. So just quickly look at the bigger picture of the microclot presence. We know that they, they are widely present in all chronic inflammatory diseases. We know that they can be stained with various fluorogenic dyes like theoflavin T and also other dyes like amitraca, and there are many more. We know they are resistant to normal process of fibrinolysis, and we know we can induce uh, these microclots by adding spike protein to it. We also know that they can exhibit considerable structural and evil spectral uh, heterogeneity, and we need to study all of these aspects still. So therefore, we say that long COVID is a complex heterogeneous disease, and we cannot simply say that we need to look at only size and numbers of microclots. We need to also look at the content, the activity of these microclots and the biochemical characteristics. And we cannot ignore the role of hyperactivated platelets. With all of these taken into, into account, we suggest that long COVID is therefore a thrombotic endothelitis. And just in conclusion, we know, therefore, we have shown it, and many others have shown that there's a relevance for receptive inflammatory marker interactions in driving the pathology. We also know that the fibrinogen molecule can have direct protein-protein interactions with spike protein and other inflammatory molecules. And we do believe there's a novel uh, methods uh, or place for novel methods where we could diagnose perhaps long COVID as well as other well-known diseases. And Imaging flow cytometry may, might be central here. So with that, uh, that's just in a nutshell what we have been doing. I hope it gave a, a nice overview for your listeners. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so let's have a look for some other questions, but I think you mentioned most of them. Um, you touched on almost of the question of our community members. Uh, there's only one more that I would like to ask. Professor Douglas Kell and other researchers have mentioned that plasma pheresis, unlike hyperpheresis, is not an option for treating microplots. Can you explain a bit the theory behind this? 
I can unfortunately not comment on plasmapheresis or help apheresis, what is better or not, because I have not seen data from plasmapheresis. Um, help apheresis, we work closely with uh, Dr. Beata Jaeger, and actually one of my PhD students are in her laboratory, in her clinic, where she looks at um, at, at treatment of patients and uh, we assist her with the, the microscopy. But as I haven't seen any data on plasmapheresis or I haven't done it myself, it would not be a good idea for me to comment on something that I have not done myself. I think um, the 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 feel or, and and the how the 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 clinicians and researchers feel about plasma phoresis or long COVID for long COVID treatment and health apheresis. You know, you can't you can't go on a a, a treatment method on just how you feel. You need to have data. And if there's no data, we cannot report on, on what is happening in the patient. So I think we need to have data and someone needs to do it. Unfortunately, we haven't done it before. We do know that people have had great success with help apheresis. Uh, I am not sure if plasma apheresis is a option because I haven't looked at the data previously. Okay, fine. So thank you very much, Professor Pretorius. It was a pleasure having you on. And may I thank you in the name of our community for everything you do for all of us. Thank you very much. It is my pleasure and I hope that we will have better treatment options uh, and more data very soon so that we can help many more patients. Okay, thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.